you were able to take time out of your schedule here Thank at the you. conference to come up here and chat with us. We were really looking forward to, to talking to you. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here, and I'm delighted to talk about my favorite topic, copyright. Well, well it's, a great, it's a great honor to have you here. Thank you. So, uh, Ruth, you were telling us in the plenary this morning about your early childhood love for books. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? And then I'd like to hear how you got involved with the professional librarians for the IFLA negotiations and all of that stuff. So I have always um, loved books. They were my escape as a child when I was um, in a situation where I, I was both feeling isolated and um, unable to adapt to a new country, um, a new culture, uh, a new set of friends. I, I spoke the language. I uh, was raised in an English-speaking home. I was from a country that had been uh, previously a British colony. So lots of things that one would have thought actually would have made it easy to assimilate. Um, and I had never really understood about racial tension in the United States. And so when I came to America with my parents and went to a private school and experienced um, racial tension for the first time and, and couldn't quite put my finger on it, um, I sought for an escape. And books were my escape. I mean, it didn't really matter uh, what color I was, how tall I was, how pretty I was. Um, I could delve into a book and just lose myself. And I, I met many wonderful friends as I read. Um, and so I started going to the library. Mm -hmm. And uh, the library uh, became my favorite place to, to spend time. Um, I uh, read everything that I could lay my fingers on. Uh, the librarians would wonderfully steer me into new places to find new adventures, and I read everything from fiction to history to um, all, um, all kinds of um, genres of novels. And, and I actually learned to be undiscriminating. I'm completely undiscriminating in what I love to read. I will read anything, <laughs> um, and I will read anywhere. In fact, I have to tell you this, that my parents would, after they discovered just how much I, would read, I was reading, would take books away from me. That was my punishment. Like, I really got spanked. I just got my <laughs> books taken away. My father put a limit on my borrowing 10 books a week, because otherwise, you dragged sacks of books home from the library, you said. I, I was allowed 10 and once a week. I didn't let my parents know how many <laughs> books that was, I so was So you had a quota. That's, that's I interesting. Had a quota. <laughs> well, because I, I had the Ruth problem. Yeah. You, know? you were addicted to books, which isn't yes. a bad addiction. If you've got to have an addiction, that's a pretty good one to have. Love it. So I then, still am. So then how did you get entwined with the professional librarian associations and the whole engagement with the library treaty and all of that? Well, I think it's, there's truth to the saying that um, so much of who we are as adults is fundamentally shaped by both our, ex especially ex our experiences, but especially experiences that um, mark us, experiences that remind us of the values that we now hold dear and why we hold them. And so for me, libraries have always held a very big part of my life and a very special place in my heart. And I think because of that, um, anything that had to do with libraries was immediately appealing to me. Almost instinctively, I would be drawn to it. My mother was a librarian, and um, in fact, I remember saying to her, I want to be a librarian. Um, and I thought all librarians did was read. <laughs> so I wanted to be a librarian, like, you know, yeah. why, why else? Um, but um, I went to work with my mother one day, and she was cataloging. And immediately I realized, oh, there's more to being a librarian than just reading. And I thought, maybe I should rethink this. <laughs> um, but my love affair with libraries continued, and so um, I began um, in law school to study copyright. Now, the reason... I was attracted to copyright as an area of law was because I saw in the Massachusetts Copyright Act, um, and this is before we had a federal copyright system, um, that the opening preamble talked about the importance of copyright for education. Both my parents were teachers. I grew up in a home where 
access to schools and the assumption that you would go to graduate school was not negotiable. Um, and so education and learning in libraries mm -hmm. have been this um, uh, trifecta in my life. Um, anything that had to do with knowledge um, and increasing in knowledge was really important to me. And so I began to study intellectual property and copyright in particular. That led, of course, to um, becoming an expert in copyright law and in particular international copyright law. Um, where I was very interested in the role of copyright in facilitating education, the role of copyright law in improving outcomes for people. And I think, again, always remembering what access to books had done for me as a little girl struggling mm -hmm. with uh, the injustices um, that were around me at the time, um, the solace that I found in books and, and how that changed me. In fact, um, my access to the libraries in New York and my love of books really helped me in law school read and consume vast amounts of information that I would probably have had to learn at a much early, mm -hmm. uh, much later age. And so that really is the, the background to how I became mm -hmm. involved um, with copyright law and, and how it not only became both an intellectual interest, but really what I view as a calling. Um, because it speaks so directly to the things that I am most passionate about, education, learning, and improving society. So um, copyright-wise, what is it that, is there anything that keeps you awake at night? Things that you really worry about with respect to copyright? Yes, it's interesting. I, I, I tell my students this, so, so I should share it with, with you and Tom both, that um, while copyright is what um, I, I'm an expert in and, and love to study and, and research and write mm -hmm. about, um, it is the area of law that I least like to teach. Mm -hmm. um, and that's because it has become an area of law where the principles and the rules are not reflective of a public policy that we are trying to vindicate. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm copyright has become so much of a legal regime that facilitates um, the capacity to charge rent for access to copyrightable works. And so once you have a key that unlocks financial resources for creators, it's very difficult mm -hmm. then to extricate the interests of um, the industries that support creative works and the public policy um, commitment to make cultural works available to the public. And that tension has always been difficult, but in the last um, two decades it has become, in my view, unmanageable. And mm -hmm. so for every copyright um, decision by a court for every effort to uh, modify the copyright uh, statute. It's incredibly fraught with tension um, and compromise um, and trade-offs and bargains. Mm -hmm. So what we refer to as copyright law today is not necessarily the product of careful, deliberate, considered, thoughtful um, ideas, mm. but how do we improve the system? It's, it really is a bargain. How do we create pragmatic outcomes w in which no one is fully satisfied, but the system continues mm -hmm. to go on? And that is dissatisfying for someone who mm. views um, the importance of public policy and the vindication of public policy as necessary to ensure that the law is delivering not only to individual creators, but to the public as a whole. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So there's that conflict between commercial interests and the public good, it sounds like, is what you're concerned about. Yes, and, and it, commercial interests don't always have to be in tension with the public good. We, I think it's important that creators are able to um, recoup their resources, are able to be rewarded for their contributions to society. Um, and I think it's very important, as Congress has noted and as courts have noted, um, that it is unjust mm -hmm. 
to allow someone to profit off of another person's labor. Mm -hmm. um, but these are foundational norms mm -hmm. and principles, how to operationalize a world in which we facilitate access to books and to um, cultural works, music, um, and yet at the same time ensure reward to mm -hmm. creators is a, is a much more difficult um, um, endeavor, and it's difficult across different industries mm -hmm. and varies across okay. different in industries. And so Anne asked earlier, how did you start working with the libraries? Libraries are an important intermediary. Mm -hmm. um, and so libraries become one of those necessary institutions for ensuring that those who can't mm -hmm. afford books or who can't afford cultural goods have a place where they can at least enjoy them. Mm -hmm. We've just begun answering the next question because you obviously disagree with those pundits who think libraries are superfluous or irrelevant in the internet age. What do you think libraries are, can bring in terms of access to content, and they still bring in this internet age, in terms of access to content and discoverability and these kinds of things? What, what is it that libraries uniquely can still do? Um, Libraries, I view, are, are, are absolutely essential, and perhaps, let me say, more essential today than they were when I was growing up. And, and that's a hard statement for me to make um, as having shared with you just how important libraries were to me, to my sanity, to my, to my education, uh, to my assimilation into American, into American culture. But libraries today uh, constitute a safe space a safe space for research where there is the combined efforts of the researcher and a librarian in search of a realm of information that is available without cues or um, ads or sponsored content, um, but just information that allows the researcher, um, the curious seeker, the reader, to cultivate um, both a taste for and an appreciation of a variety mm -hmm. of resources, and then to come to his or her own judgment about what this content mm -hmm. means, how to use it, how to implement it, what does it do for the work or the question that mm -hmm. I came to the library for. I, I loved the library because I would often come in, and I'd say this to my students, I would often come in to the library um, wanting to research one thing. I had one thing and that was to do my assignment and this was my research question. But I would be headed to the bookshelf where uh, this one book could be found and right next to that book I would see a title. I'd go, well that looks interesting. And then I'd see the next title. and then. Instead of one book, I, I would have picked up five <laughs> or ten. And there I am spread out on this library table, and the one question has become five. And the solution that I thought I was going to find has led me to more questions and, and more answers, and, and, I'm, and I'm asking more questions. Mm -hmm. And the capacity and the place of libraries, not only as a place where you find but as a place where you search mm -hmm. is irreplaceable. It is irreplaceable. And I find that it is irreplaceable in, in a fundamental number of ways. It's irreplaceable in its capacity to expand the horizon mm -hmm. of resources that you encounter at once. It's, it's irreplaceable in its ability to create opportunities to learn that there are more than one um, area of law or one area of literature or one area of history that I need to search if I'm looking for a fulsome answer. Um, it's irreplaceable in its capacity to help me meet someone else who is in the library at the same time. Oh, are you researching this same question? And all of a sudden <laughs> yeah. this conversation yeah. begins and, and you begin to build community around a shared set of ideas. If we are serious about addressing the dangers of learning in isolation that have produced an incapacity or lessened capacity for clear judgment that has reduced the ability to nurture intuition that has uh, constrained uh, our ability to, de to determine when something is fake versus when something is genuine 
um, we need to reinvigorate the importance of mm -hmm. libraries in our public discourse and in our conception of what are vital agencies that we mm -hmm. need in our um, society today. Well, I think you've hit on something that we forget how important library as place yes. is in, to our uh, individual educations and, and just the community that, we, that we're involved in. Absolutely. Yeah. There are some significant challenges that we face in terms of things like globalized copyright, um, uh, fake news, uh, preserving fair use, and I'm wondering what can today's library do to, what role should they play in, in trying to preserve those, those kinds of values and, and meet those challenges? Um, I think that libraries are important um, as trusted institutions, not just trusted spaces, but trusted institutions. Um, many libraries are affiliated with educational institutions, and, and the idea, of course, is to provide um, students with the resources necessary mm -hmm. to amplify, supplement, research, uh, pursue additional knowledge beyond the classroom. And so in many ways, libraries were um, the start of your educational process in the sense that that was where most of us learned how to read. We, we went to libraries and borrowed books, and there was this whole, um, uh, there was this whole uh, sort of celebratory, emancipatory feeling when your mother would take your hand or your father or your caregiver mm -hmm. would take your hand and take you to the library and you would, as a five or six year old, take mm -hmm. out the books that you <laughs> wanted to read. Right? Even that idea of independent selection, mm -hmm. which now is so um, underappreciated and in many ways um, underutilized all the way to um, being in a university and having a mm -hmm. university library where you could easily access to do your homework and, and to study and to meet with classmates and to think about that. And so as a trusted institution, I knew going into a library that I would have a wealth of resources, a variety mm -hmm. of resources, different perspectives that my teachers expected me to consult. And Knowing what the variety was, knowing the different genres of literature, the different perspectives, the, the critiques of one dominant theory or the other, informed my own capacity and today my students' capacity to discern what arguments mm -hmm. are strong, what historical data points actually support one or two views, um, what are the limits of these views, what are the strengths of these views, so that when we're having debates, we're not just having debates about what I feel mm -hmm. and what I think or what you feel and what you think, but that we're able to inform our feelings and our views with facts and data and history and context. That's so missing mm -hmm. um, when you do not have libraries to give you um, that opportunity. And I think libraries play that role. They, they play the role in, in, in enhancing our ability to filter mm -hmm. information um, and not just filter for the purposes of saying this is fake and this is real, but filter for saying this has been supported by evidence, this has been reinforced by additional studies, the capacity to compare, the capacity mm -hmm. to think about, well, this is what we do in South Carolina. What, how do they think of this question in Massachusetts? What's the history, right? That comparison because now our intolerance for other perspectives mm -hmm. in many ways stems from the fact that we're so steeped in our own. Mm -hmm. um, and the work of comparison is harder to do. Mm -hmm. Whereas a library immediately on the shelf, typically, or in the catalog, or a librarian will guide you, well, if you're looking for this question and how it was addressed in this time period, here's where you might go, right? Um, curating information. Um, being in a place where questions can be both asked and answered. And so libraries not only give us that trusted institutional sense of, I can go to a library to actually check this out. Um, I can go to a library and see what other resources might be available to inform my, my opinion. I might go to a library and talk to a librarian who spends his or her days every day looking at the wealth of books and information that mm -hmm. are being generated um, and making decisions about how to make that available. Mm -hmm. And knowing that if it's not in my local library, 
my local library can find another library that has it. The collaboration between libraries mm -hmm. that enrich the life of the average citizen, that is hard to replicate in any mm -hmm. other setting. And so I think when you think about things like fair use, and in particular in the United States, the exceptions for libraries and the much needed exceptions for libraries globally, it is important um, because it's what facilitates civic discourse, mm -hmm. it facilitates learning, it um, enhances our capacity to appreciate a variety of perspectives, it builds intuition. Um, I could go on, but just to give you a sense of, of why I think the trust factor distinguishes libraries today um, and why its enabling role in, pr in promoting good citizenship mm -hmm. is really irreplaceable. Mm -hmm. well, I like the term that you used in your presentation. You referred to the libraries and librarians as fake news warriors, yes. which I thought was, <laughs> yes. was, was on yes. target. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. Um, libraries and, and librarians, I mean, uh, my librarians know, and I, if, they're, if any of them is watching this interview, <laughs> how much I appreciate them, um, their, their ability. I, I go with one question and, and, and they'll say, well, have you considered this particular um, aspect of this question? And, and all of a sudden, they, they, they are, I call them um, oftentimes my eye drops. Right. When, when, I, when I have one dry research question, my librarians <laughs> come with eye drops <laughs> and they say, have you considered this realm um, and this perspective and, and how about we bring you resources that help sharpen what you can see and what mm -hmm. you can take away from this, from this line of inquiry? Interesting. Mm -hmm. You had said five or ten minutes ago that one of the difficulties with copyright law in the U.S. was that instead of necessarily any longer being based in some kind of public policy, it's a series of compromises. I've actually thought of copyright law as a series of compromises for decades now. To me, it just seems, and especially when I worked at the Association of Research Libraries in Washington, D.C., copyright seemed like a, a space where people from different interest groups and in different industries all got together and lobbied with their congressperson or got together in meetings like the Conference on Fair Use, tried to thrash out guidelines, often unsuccessfully. And I used to say to students in my workshops, um, Copyright law just takes years to develop and change because it requires all these stakeholders to get together and hammer something out, and it's really hard to do. So I've always thought of it as a set of uneasy compromises. Are there countries that do things differently? Do, you, are, are, do we have any examples of copyright legislation or discussions which are actually based in this idea of public good and education and all of that mm -hmm. and aren't quite so influenced or tarnished by all the special interest groups that want to have a say? Um, or is it just like that worldwide? Well, it certainly is more like that worldwide today. Mm -hmm. um, and that, of course, is the result of globalization, mm -hmm. international mm -hmm. trade. Mm -hmm. um, the harmonization of copyright law. Um, although, of course, as you might imagine, copyright law in its global dimension um, actually has a long, long history uh, since um, the Berne Convention um, for the Protection of Literary and Artistic Works um, of 1886. So we're talking about um, a, a system that has been international mm -hmm. for, mm -hmm. for quite um, a lengthy period of time. 1886, um, though, of course, was a very different time technologically. It was a very different time socially. Um, and what <coughs> we saw in 1886 was um, the need to protect authors. And authors were really at the heart mm -hmm. of this move to mm -hmm. secure um, authorial rights 
in countries all over the world. And the idea was that if you were an author and your work was being sold um, or distributed in another country and you lived in a different country, um, that there would be a respect and an integrity um, and a legitimacy accorded to your work. And it, it really was uh, the idea that authors ought to be able to protect their interests and protect themselves and, and uh, maintain a reward for the work that they had produced. But even then, in 1886, Victor Hugo, who was a major proponent um, of the Berne Convention um, and really was the president of the um, association that, that was almost single-handedly responsible for galvanizing the negotiations around the Berne Convention, Victor Hugo recognized that there had to be a limit, recognized that there was a public policy interest mm -hmm. in making sure that the public had access to works. The idea for many artists, for many authors, has never been to lock up knowledge um, mm -hmm. and make it available only to those who can afford it or only on terms that the author prescribes. And, and so this notion that it always has to be um, a compromise in which um, the interests of the public might not be fully vindicated um, is not really historically accurate. That, that even in 1886, there was clear recognition that there was a solid public interest in the design of copyright law. That recognition um, has become even more urgent today because in 1886, and, and frankly, for most of copyright's history, we were protecting um, a very narrow range of things. Copyright protected in the United States, maps, books, and charts. Mm -hmm. um, once we began to expand the scope of copyright to include architectural works and software and graphical works, mm -hmm. uh, essentially anything that satisfies the criteria for copyrightability, fixation mm -hmm. and originality in the United States is copyrightable, um, this vast universe of copyrightable works means that cultural goods of all stripes are now um, protected mm -hmm. through these property rights. And that carries very significant consequences for how the public gets access to them. Now, what's interesting, I think, is most authors want their books to be read. Most people don't write to, to, mm -hmm. to lock their books up in, in um, drawers. Most artists want their artwork to be seen. Mm -hmm. Most musicians want their music to, be, to that's, be heard. That's why they do it. This is why <laughs> they do it. That's why they do um, it. And so copyright um, has become a caricature of its own objectives. Right? Copyright, which is meant to facilitate the capacity to disseminate, um, has now become the reason to withhold mm -hmm. in many cases, and that I think is is really a, a tragedy, um, and that requires then a much more robust resurrection of the public interest, and which is where a lot of my work is. Mm -hmm. What does it mean to say that copyright is a tool of the public interest? How do we advance the public good? What kinds of limitations and exceptions um, are effective, um, fair? Um, and work to both facilitate access and reward mm -hmm. the author or the copyright owner. There's also, of course, I think, um, the complication that our copyright industries are not strictly about the authors, the artists themselves, mm -hmm. that our copyright industries have many intermediaries that finance the, mm -hmm. the, the, the production of cultural goods. And so when you think about what the average movie budget is, or you think about um, what publishers, um, you know, what it costs for publishers to maintain mm -hmm. infrastructure and, and to market and to release the books. Um, there are costs involved, and, and, and we have to think about what business models make the most sense mm -hmm. um, for these industries. But the public interest then gets lost in all of that. When you mm -hmm. begin to think, well, mm -hmm. how, how do we sustain the publishing mm -hmm. industry? How, how do we make cultural goods um, effectively accessible? when they cost so much to make, are there other models that we might implement to deal with the finances mm -hmm. of cultural production? And these are some of the questions that we ought to mm -hmm. be asking. Are there other ways to finance movies? What, what, what does that look like? Because the less we have 
models to work with, the less models we have to work with, the more copyright needs to be strong just to facilitate the collection of reward economically to make the system work. And I think those big questions are not the ones that get answered in the bargains and in the um, sort of the horse trading that takes place when we're trying to do copyright law. And almost every country is now caught in the throes of this because the system has been international for so long. Mm -hmm. Well, that's a little discouraging. What's the best thing about the copyright regime? <laughs> now that we've talked about the, the real the challenges. Yeah, problems. The challenges. Um, you know, the copyright regime, I always, when days when I want to encourage myself, <laughs> I um, look at some of our older copyright statutes um, at the state level in the United States or, or I look at the Declaration of Independence or I look at um, some of our uh, celebrated authors historically um, and the works that they wrote and how those works have disseminated ideas about freedom and equality and um, and the virtues of life and, um, and how they facilitated debate. I mean, t the fact of the matter is that copyright law has worked. It has worked to um, promote knowledge um, and it has worked to make knowledge available to more people than in the age of scribes. It has worked to ensure that um, libraries are stocked with books. Um, it has forced us to think about um, the importance of freeing artists and writers from private patronage, which is what the system was before, to a more open system where, where people could write what they wanted to write and explore their own ideas and intellect. And so I think that the, the system is faced with a lot of challenges. But in part, those challenges are because it's so vital. The history of the success mm -hmm. of copyright mm -hmm. has created these challenges. Um, and, and so now we have to think about how we confront the challenges, um, preserve the system um, without making it inaccessible for vast m members of the public. I, I think that laws that work best are laws that are legitimate, and, um, or at least perceived as legitimate by the public. And when there is a law that says, um, you can't make copies of um, music that you have lawfully purchased um, um, and that you can't photocopy books that, that you own and, and, and bought and, and that you can't resell a copy of your own book. Um, that's a problem. It be mm -hmm. The law mm -hmm. begins to lose its legitimacy. Mm -hmm. um, and that, be, then that then, I think, raises new challenges for us. So, um, so we have a lot of work ahead of us. I, I think that the challenges are there. Um, but it means that, that we cannot afford a system that we make the law only by uh, bargaining. Right? We actually have to think right. about what we want this law to look like and what we want it to accomplish. You, in, 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 in your keynote uh, this morning, you, you brought up a concept that I wasn't fully aware of. You had said that libraries were embedded and are embedded in copyright law. And for those folks who didn't get a chance to, to hear your, your wonderful keynote, could you talk a little bit more about that in libraries being embedded in, in copyright? And I also wonder, do you think we're in danger of losing that? Yeah, I mean, I, um, libraries from the very first Copyright Act, as I mentioned in my keynote this morning, the Statute of Anne in, um, in the UK, uh, libraries were very much a part of the design of modern copyright law. Um, in Part 5 of the Statute of Anne, um, publishers had to deposit uh, copies of the um, printed works in designated libraries. And these included university libraries, so um, they also included private libraries, Royal uh, li Library in the Royal Palace. Um, and those works, nine copies, which back in the day is a lot of copies. Um, compare that to the one copy that librarians are able library to make under Section 108, right? Um, nine copies um, had to be deposited. Um, and if the deposit was not made, there was a penalty. 
not only were these libraries in the statute specifically mentioned, the Library of the University of Oxford, for example, um, um, uh, was one of those mentioned. If the, li the, the deposits were not made, then uh, the librarians were to demand them. <laughs> so it wasn't just libraries, librarians. They had an active role in they soliciting had an role the books. in making okay. sure that the storehouse of books continued to be fed. Okay. And so I, I, I see this, um, and I see this as a remarkable insight and a remarkable understanding of the importance of a place where the public could have access to works. Note that it was not just one copy. If it had just been one copy, we'd say, well, maybe they were thinking of museums mm. <laughs> or archives. But no, it was more than one. Why? So that there could be meaningful access mm. to these works that were published. And that librarians were to be vigilant. They were to be vigilant in making sure that those deposits were made. And that if they weren't made, they were to be faithful in making mm. sure that they asked for them. And so often I think that libraries um, see themselves and feel understandably caught in the crossfire between the noble and um, inspiring and uh, great demand of the public for access and the legitimate um, but intensely pressurizing feel of responding as officials of the copyright system to the concerns of publishers and rights owners. And that's an untenable place for libraries. Because libraries were not designed to be copyright officials. They were designed to be the stewards of knowledge. And that's a very different role from what many librarians are being asked to play today. Mm -hmm. Very really asked, our, our tradition is to provide as much access as we possibly can and being asked to be copyright enforcers plays against that. Yes. So, and uh, the, what about the current situation though? Would, are, are libraries in a good spot when it comes, comes to, to this as far as protecting access to, to books and, and the public value or the public good of being having access uh, given the current copyright situation? I don't believe that libraries are in a good spot. Um, you know, I, I tend to, I am one that likes to look at the glasses as half full, and, and so I will always say I will take libraries today where they are versus a world in which there were no libraries. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, it's sort of like riding a bicycle. If you're not making progress, you're usually falling off. It's hard <laughs> to stay stationary on a bicycle. And so my concern as a researcher, as a scholar, as a teacher, as a consumer of books, as I'm an educator and one who, by the way, worked in the library um, while in law school. My concern is that there, there is a need to reinvigorate um, and in some ways retool our vision of libraries for the digital age. It's very difficult to get things done policy-wise and legislative-wise, but within the community of librarians, it is important to take a leadership role in highlighting, identifying, and then constructing what libraries today need to be doing, should continue to do, and what resources legally, instrumentally, policy-wise are necessary to facilitate those outcomes. So take, for example, the whole debate about the first sale doctrine. The first sale doctrine is a doctrine that says when you have purchased the physical copy of an expressive work, a work protected by copyright, you can sell it. And that comes in part from another rule in most common law jurisdictions, um, um, a rule, a disposition that um, uh, really resists efforts to restrict the alienability of things that you own, the alienability of property. 
Right. So your ability to sell things that you own um, is very much a part of our legal system, and selling a book that you've bought is a part of that. And so historically, there have been efforts to say, well, if you if you buy this book, you're not allowed to sell it um, without getting the permission of the copyright owner. Of course, that just went nowhere very quickly um, because of this general rule um, prohibiting restrictions on alienability. And so the first sale doctrine was it, it was born and, and, and remains a robust part of copyright law. But in the world of digital books, there is no first sale doctrine. And in the few cases that exist of digital first sale, um, courts have not yet identified such a doctrine with respect to, um, at least with respect to music. And this is being foreclosed. The prospect of a digital for sale is being foreclosed in part by um, licensing agreements saying, well, because if you didn't buy it, then you don't own it. And if you don't own it, then you can't resell it or, mm -hmm. or, or transfer it in any other way. And so that's just a little example, I think, of the ways in which Libraries have to begin to think, well, how, how did we acquire books? What, was the what were the structural conditions um, under which we acquired books? Um, and do we now need to begin to think about a contracts exception mm. for libraries, just mm. as we had it for copyright? Because if the majority of your digital collections are going to be through licensing agreements, should libraries be treated in the same way as every other purchaser out there? who is pur purchasing for private consumption, these are questions libraries should be asking. Because I think because copyright law historically has been the principal domain in which libraries and copyright have intersected, libraries and librarians have not looked at other areas of the law mm -hmm. um, as also needing some attention in order to preserve the vitality of a library in our modern society. And so these are things that we need to begin to think about. Yes. Um, you can create an exception for libraries, which I believe in and which I advocate for. Um, but if the exception is tied to the purchase of a book, then you're just repeating the problem over mm -hmm. again. Because if you're a licensee and not a purchaser, then you don't get some of these exceptions. So these are things that um, I think become important for libraries to get a head start on to begin thinking about. If we were to create a world of libraries today, what kinds of rights, what kinds of um, permissions, what kinds of expectations can be built in to the regime and begin that way. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not sure that making incremental improvements is enough in a world where one of our greatest needs for human flourishing is to ensure that people have access to legitimate, genuine, genuinely produced information. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I think of it the way I think of clean water. Yes, there is water everywhere, but drinkable water is actually a precious and rare commodity in many parts of the world. And librarians um, are really our best bet for clean water in the era of an information mm -hmm. deluge, mm -hmm. where so much of that information is either false or unusable. Well, let me switch gears for a minute and ask you if there is some current copyright legislation or an important current case that's going through the system that we should maybe know about and pay attention to, that we might not be. Oh, boy. I, I have so many cases in mind, but um, let me just Pick share. One. <laughs> Let me share one that's in the Supreme Court because um, the Supreme Court has been an active um, and important part of our copyright jurisprudence in, in, in the U.S. And so there is a case currently um, that the Supreme Court has granted um, a search to, and, and we will hopefully be getting a decision um, um, soon on this. And it's a case. Uh, that involves copyright registration. 
And I'm picking this case as the case mm -hmm. to highlight here because registration um, is what was essential for, li for, certainly for the Library of Congress, um, but even for, at, at, in certain states, state libraries also relied on registration um, as a way of increasing mm -hmm. um, their, um, uh, their collections. So this is a case called Fourth Estate, and it, the question is whether or not before a copyright infringement lawsuit can be initiated, um, do you have to have registration, a registration in hand, or can you simply apply? In other words, what does the word registration mean? When the copyright statute says um, that a, a precondition to filing suit mm -hmm. is that the work must have been registered. Right. Uh, and, we've what does that mean? Yes. Right. and we've thought this for years. Yes, and we've thought this for years. And so uh, there's a circuit split. Some circuits um, say you have to have the registration in hand. And in fact, um, the registration, your copyright uh, registration, typically must be attached to your um, filing before the court, right? It's mm -hmm. got to be part right, of what right, you have right. court. Other circuits have said, no, it's a mere technicality. It's just a tick the box. All you have to show us is that you have applied for registration, okay. and that does mm -hmm. it, and you can file your lawsuit. So the question before the court. I didn't know there was this disparity. Yes, mm -hmm. there's this okay. disparity between the circuits. So the question before the court is, what mm -hmm. does registration mean? Um, it's called sort of the, 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 the difference between the registration approach and the application approach. And the court has been called upon to rule mm. on which approach is consistent with the language in the statute. Now, my opinion on this matter is I hope the court picks the registration approach. And I say that because the registration approach was not designed, and registration itself was not designed as a mere formality. We have the Library of Congress today because we designed a copyright system, as I said, with libraries embedded in the system. And deposits of works from the very first Copyright Act in the United States, you had to deposit copies of your work at the Library of Congress. And today, no matter what you're looking for, the Library of Congress is likely to have it. In many ways, the Library of Congress was a necessary institution for a young republic. Libraries were essential for building, mm -hmm. as we've said earlier, a civic right. society. It was necessary to have access to books that were produced not only in the United States, but around the world. Charles Dickens became a fixture in American literary landscape because of the way our copyright mm -hmm. system was designed to ensure that the works of Charles Dickens, much to his annoyance, but that the <laughs> works of Charles Dickens were very much cheaply available, they were available in yeah. the United States. <laughs> a country and a society that is dedicated to building citizens, not just members, citizens, must take the role mm -hmm. of library seriously. And if funding libraries in a world of scarce resources um, is a challenge, the registration approach was a public policy mechanism that it ensured that at least one library, if not all, at least one library had access to works. And that's why this ecosystem of libraries and the capacity for libraries to share works mm -hmm. and to exchange and to make copies and to do archives is so vital. Mm -hmm. And this is all built into the copyright system. and so. When we think about a copyright system and we refer to it as, oh, it's just an exception, I actually don't think of it mm. as just an exception. I think of it as a deliberate policy design to accomplish the public policy goals of the copyright system, mm -hmm. to improve and encourage learning. Mm -hmm. And so this is a case that could be viewed as, oh, it's just resolving a circuit split about the interpretation of legislative text. And certainly, we could view it that way. Mm -hmm. In my opinion, the ramifications are deeper. That what the court is called upon to do is to rule on the survivability 
of a historic public policy that underlined the very beginnings of our copyright system and whether or not in our ratification of the Berne Convention we essentially traded off global protection and then agreed to cede or to water down or to dilute mm -hmm. this public policy mm -hmm. that under that really fueled um, the development of the Library of Congress. And so I view it as, a, as an important case. I view it as a case that will reveal to us um, the resilience of the public mm -hmm. policy dimension of copyright. It's a case that I think librarians should be watching very closely because I don't think that the relationship between copyright formalities and the vitality of libraries has been really mm -hmm. well appreciated. Um, and it's a case that frankly speaks to the limits of globalization as the solution for copyright policy. That it's important for public policy purposes for nations to experiment mm -hmm. and to think about the design of copyright law in a way that facilitates very particular ends. We were a young republic. We were a republic very much um, dependent on Great Britain, a young republic that needed mm -hmm. to build an educated citizenry, a young republic that needed to think about ideas mm -hmm. of governance and to foster the cultivation of artists and writers so that public discourse could be rich and diverse. Um, and while we have a deluge of information and ideas today, I don't think that anyone would argue that the need for civic discourse is less today. Mm -hmm. It's interesting that that role that, and I it really didn't, uh, wasn't that I wasn't as fully aware of it as I should have been, the role that copyright and registration played in the development of the Library of Congress and just this development of information accessible for the public good. And that, that's something that we're, uh, we need to be careful about, the possibility of losing. Yeah. I agree. And I think we need to lead. I, you know, I, the challenge with globalization, it's both a strength and a challenge, is it purports to harmonize norms so that every country is operating under the same base, at least with mm -hmm. the same baseline. And that's good for predictability, for, for you know, um, efficiency, for um, stability. The challenge, of course, is what if we all get it wrong? What if the baseline is wrong? And so there always has to be space for countries to say, we choose to deviate mm -hmm. from the baseline because we believe that it is in the best interest mm -hmm. of the public for which these laws exist. Um, and I think that the U.S. registration system really had a legitimate, vital, and enduring public policy mm -hmm. concern, and that that is a concern that other countries should emulate. The answer should not be that we get rid of registration. The answer should be that we encourage more effective globalized mm -hmm. registration systems that are actually allow for um, not only libraries to thrive, but frankly users to know who the authors are and, and mm -hmm. how to get permission for use um, in a world where, you know, our standards for copyrightability are so low that any most things are mm -hmm. copyrightable, mm -hmm. right? Um, and yet everyone is using many things without permission because nobody knows how to trace the author. Mm -hmm. What could be um, more helpful than a system in which mm -hmm. we encourage people to register? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Last year you also spoke at the conference. You spoke at uh, uh, the long arm of the law, which Anne, which Anne does for us every year and is a very, very popular popular program. But you expressed some concern about a, uh, the creation of a small copyright claims tribunal. And you, you express, express concern about it. And I'm wondering if you could give us a little status report on it and if you think librarians still need to be a little bit leery about the possibility of, that, of its creation. 
Um, I, I mean, there are lots of, um, like every idea, um, I, I think there's some, there's some merit to a small copyright claims tribunal. I ultimately, on the net, think that it is not, at this time, the wisest move that we could make. Mm -hmm. And so I still have some concerns. I have concerns about the fact that whenever you carve out um, a institution to address a piece of a larger problem, you begin to create specialized norms that will often find their way back, frankly, and complicate matters. Um, but also because um, it doesn't fundamentally address some of the greater challenges that we have about copyright litigation. It's expensive, mm -hmm. uh, difficulties of proof, the low standards of copyrightability, the scope of what is now mm -hmm. copyrightable, um, you know, this wide expanse. Um, and of course, it doesn't get rid of um, the challenge of having uh, statutory uh, damages, mm -hmm. um, which act as a disincentive, frankly, um, to, um, um, to users, because if, if you know that an author doesn't need to prove anything, um, you immediately are going to seek permission um, in, in, in circumstances that you may not even uh, necessarily need to. So I, I overall am skeptical and it doesn't appear to have gathered momentum, which I'm thankful about, but but you know, ideas like this don't go, they don't disappear. Right. And there is sort of a, um, a, a historical analog to this in other areas of, of IP. I should also say that if you asked me to pick between a small claims copyright tribunal and the privatized dispute settlement that occurs through the platforms, right, on the internet, mm. I would pick this because it's at least a public mm. and visible, um, um, you know, creation. But privately, you want to share um, a file with um, a colleague or you want to post something for critique um, and you want your former students and your current students to be able to comment on it and so you put it on a, on a, on a more of a public space rather than just a class mm. listserv. There are all kinds of things that um, uh, service providers, internet service providers, can basically say, well, no, you take that down. And then you have to go back and forth. We had this experience at Harvard Law School when my colleague, Terry Fisher, um, um, had to defend on fair use grounds the posting um, of a copyrightable work, which we had mm -hmm. done for students to be able to uh, respond to a classroom lecture. Um, but this automatic You've got to take it down. The power of service providers to do that. Um, it's not so much that one might dispute that power, but it is a private power um, and doesn't have the benefits of a public, um, you know, cre a publicly created um, institution that has some accountability. And so I think we have a lot of work to do with respect to thinking about how we improve the system. I'm not sure the tribunal at least as originally envisaged, is such an improvement. Mm -hmm. So librarians just need to keep an eye on it. Uh, I absolutely think they need to keep an eye on it. So we have talked about copyright today increasingly being a series of compromises between diverse mm -hmm. stakeholders inputting their ideas and we come to some kind of something and then the law gets changed on that basis. Um, so on that, uh, if we keep that in mind, what, what might copyright law look like in 20 years' time? Is it just going to be a kind of struggle to compromise in a very slow way, kind of lagging behind technology, artificial intelligence now? Or are, are we going to find a way to be more agile or nimble in getting the law to where it addresses actual situations? Mm -hmm. Do you, what's your prognosis about that? Oh boy. Um, my prognosis is that copyright law as public law mm -hmm. will become less vital and less, um, less influential in mm -hmm. shaping our public policy debates about access to knowledge. 
Because and it will seem less and less relevant? Because chunks of it will be administered through other legal regimes, mm -hmm. whether it's technological um, constraints, whether it's artificial mm -hmm. intelligence, and the whole question of can um, sentient um, you know, programs, can robots be authors, right? Um, whether it's because contracts are taking over, mm -hmm. Or the combination of all these things, technology, contracts, mm -hmm. dis private dispute settlements. The isolation that we are concerned about in our civic discourse is not just an isolation of individuals behind screens uh, consuming information and data that only they uh, all, all that they care about only because it, it reinforces their biases or reinforces their own perspectives. That isolation, I think, also applies or should apply to the, uh, the inability to recognize what decision has been made in a particular case involving access um, because it's being done behind closed doors mm. um, or contracts that will never see the light of day because they're signed between two people. In other words, perhaps my greatest concern is the privatization of a public infrastructure that has historically been the primary mm -hmm. way in which we have coordinated our information policy and our educational mm -hmm. policy and our policies on access to information. Mm -hmm. um, that privatization, whether it happens through technology or it happens through contracts, um, will continue to thin um, the scope of copyright's reach and will continue to make copyright, despite its many challenges, will continue to make copyright less vital um, and less um, effective in being the public policy tool that I think we've all thought of mm -hmm. it as being. Mm -hmm. It sounds like you're concerned if, about copyright and losing its transparency, which yeah. which really contributes to its public value. Yes, and, and frankly, you, this is why I, I feel that we have so much work ahead of us, because if copyright legislation is so hard to do, mm -hmm. then there's got to be a way to create order in the marketplace mm -hmm. for cultural goods, and they will be perhaps not defensible, perhaps not believable, but there will be logical reason mm -hmm. to say, well, let's solve it by contract. We can't, you know, the, the law doesn't speak to this. Mm -hmm. Let's make our, and let's begin to privatize mm -hmm. these outcomes. And that's, I think, not an ideal world. Mm -hmm. Not an ideal world, not if what we're trying to build is a society. Given this, and given the concerns that you, you just expressed, um, what, if you had one piece of advice to give librarians, what would it be? Could we let her have two? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, that's a hard one. One piece of advice. Well, you can have two. It's okay. <laughs> um, that's okay. So I, I, I guess I would, I, would, I would say two, but in different realms. One ad piece of advice that I would give to librarians um, is be careful what you ask for. Hmm. Librarians asked for Section 108 of the Copyright Statute in the United States. Librarians asked mm -hmm. for a very, a, a dedicated regime for libraries. And having asked for it, it put librarians as stakeholders of the copyright system. It embedded them in the system, not as um, guardians, not as gatekeepers, not as um, vehicles to implement policy, but as one of mm. many constituents. Mm. And I think it robbed libraries and librarians of quite a bit of leverage. It also meant that you couldn't improve it without touching the copyright edifice, which, as we have said, is complicated, political, and often intractable. And so here we are in a world in which more than ever we need libraries and a regime 
in which more than ever is almost impossible to change. So I would say be careful what you ask for. It means that libra libraries and librarians need to think about how do we function and improve what we're able to do given the landscape that we live in. Um, and so I think that means that libraries have to be increasingly strategic in watching developments technologically and how they impact what librarians do. Mm -hmm. The great thing about librarians is that they are the ones always typically on the cutting edge of what's out there that affects the universe of books and services that libraries provide. And helping policymakers mm -hmm. and helping users understand that not every good thing improves the outcome of your life or the outcome of society is fundamentally, that filtering capacity is fundamentally distinctive to a librarian's role. And so strategically reconfiguring how librarians speak and their capacity to identify the consequences of new technological developments for building civic society, for creating communities, for providing access is really important. When copyright lawyers become the experts on how copyright law affects libraries, I'm not sure that that's actually a good thing. <laughs> It's, it's, it's the difference between someone who, whose native language is English and someone whose learned language is English. When someone who is a native speaker hears that's a Mickey Mouse argument, immediately you know what that means mm -hmm. because it's your culture, you've grown up in it, you understand the way that this, that term is used. A learned English speaker will have to ask a question. And it is a sad world, in my view, where librarians essentially have become like learned speakers, where they're asking lawyers mm -hmm. what they can do as librarians. I would not let that world happen without a fight. That's a good piece of advice, I think. Uh, Anne and I um, don't want to miss anything. So our, our last question is, uh, not quite a trick question, but it's, it's a, a, a question that we often end these, these interviews with. And it, if you were sitting in Anne's chair, or if you were sitting in my chair, what question would you ask yourself? Ah. What question would I ask myself? I would ask myself the question, if you were given full authority to change one thing uh -oh. <laughs> that would be of consequence for librarians in the Copyright Act, what would it be? Okay, let's hear the answer. <laughs> <laughs> um, I would change the Copyright Act to limit the rights that copyright owners have to the rights of reproduction, the rights to make derivative works, but I might limit the rights of distribution because mm. libraries are eminently our first line of distributing knowledge. Mm. And so the capacity to think about what distribution mm -hmm. means, both physically, electronically, and digitally, is profound, in my view, to what libraries do. Mm -hmm. And so I would want to think about how would we rejigger the right of distribution, the right of dissemination? How would we construct it so that libraries can be the beneficiaries and not the ones asking for permission? So you've gone right at the heart of the Copyright Act. <laughs> yes. <laughs> oh, we couldn't expect we couldn't expect less from you. <laughs> so something to think about. It's it's um, it's been this has been fantastic. Thank
thank you thank so you. much for, for, again, taking time to come and talk to us. And um, I've learned so much just, just hearing you uh, speak and, and talk about these issues. It's, it's been great. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.